Nietzsche as metaphysical thinker. The book, The Will to Power. The book, The Will to Power. The being of beings as will in traditional metaphysics. Will and power, the essence of power. Now we can, indeed it seems we must, gather together the series of determinations of the essence of will which we have elaborated and can join them in a single definition, will as mastery over something, reaching out beyond itself, will as affect, the agitating seizure will as passion, the expansive plunge into the breadth of beings, will as feeling, being the state of having a stance toward oneself, and will as command. With some effort, we certainly could produce a formally proper definition bristling with all these attributes all the same, we will forego that. Not as though we laid no value on strict and univocal concepts. On the contrary, we are searching for them. But a notion is not a concept, not in philosophy at any rate, if it is not founded and grounded in such a way as to allow what it is grasping to become its standard and the pathway of its interrogation instead of camouflaging it under the net of a mere formula. 
But the concept will as the basic character of beings is to grasp, i.e. being, is not yet in our vicinity. Better, we are not close enough to it. <coughs> To be cognizant to know is not mere familiarity with concepts. Rather, it is to grasp what the concept itself catches hold of. To grasp being means to remain knowingly exposed to its sudden advance, its presencing. If we consider what the word will is to name, the essence of beings themselves, then we shall comprehend how powerless such a solitary word must remain even when a definition is appended to it. Hence Nietzsche can say, will, that is a supposition which clarifies nothing else for me. For those who know, there is no willing. From such statements, we should not conclude that the whole effort to capture the essence of will is without prospect, nothing worth, and that therefore it is a matter of indifference and arbitrariness what words or concepts we use when speaking of will. On the contrary, we have to question right from the start and continually on the basis of the matter itself. Only in that way do we arrive at the concept and the proper use of the word. Now, in order from the outset to avoid the vacuity of the word will, Nietzsche says will to power. Every willing is a willing to be more. Power itself only is in as much as and so long as it remains a willing to be more power. As soon as such will disappears, power is no longer power, even if it still holds in subjection what it has overmastered. In will, as willing to be more, as will to power, enhancement and heightening are essentially implied. For only by means of perpetual heightening can what is elevated be held aloft, only a more powerful heightening can counter the tendency to sink back simply holding on to the position already attained will not do because the inevitable consequence is ultimate exhaustion what man wants what every smallest part of a living organism wants is an increase of power let us take the simplest case that of primitive nourishment the protoplasm stretches its pseudopodia in order to search for something that resists it, not from hunger, but from will to power. It then attempts to overcome this thing, to appropriate it, to incorporate it. What we call nourishment is merely a derivative appearance, a practical application of that original will to become stronger. To will is to want to become stronger. Here too Nietzsche speaks by way of reversal, and at the same time by way of defense against a contemporary trend, namely Darwinism. Let us clarify this matter briefly. Life not only exhibits the drive to maintain itself, as Darwin thinks, but also is self-assertion. The will to maintain merely clings to what is already at hand, stubbornly insists upon it, loses itself in it, and so becomes blind to its proper essence. Self-assertion, which wants to be ahead of things, to stay on top of things, is always a going back into its essence, into the origin. Self-assertion is original assertion of essence. Will to power is never the willing of a particular actual entity. It involves the being and the essence of beings. It is this itself. 
Therefore, we can say that will to power is always essentially will. Although Nietzsche does not formulate it expressly in this way at bottom, this is what he means. Otherwise, he could not understand what he always refers to in connection with his emphasis on the character of enhancement in will, of the increase of power, namely the fact that will to power is something creative. That designation, too, remains deceptive. It often seems to suggest that in and through will to power, something is to be produced. What is decisive is not production in the sense of manufacturing, but taking up and transforming, making something other than, other in an essential way. For that reason, the need to destroy belongs essentially to creation. In destruction, the contrary, the ugly and the evil are posited. They are of necessity, necessity proper to creation, will to power and thus to being itself. To the essence of being, nullity belongs, not as sheer vacuous nothingness, but as the empowering no. We know that German idealism thought being as well. That philosophy also dared to think the negative as proper to being. It suffices to refer to a passage in the preface to Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, where Hegel avers that the monstrous power of the negative is the energy of thinking of the pure ego. Death, if we want to name that unreality so, is the most frightful thing, and to hold fast to what is dead requires the greatest force. Beauty without force hates the intellect, because intellect demands of her something of which she is incapable. But a life of spirit is not one that shies from death, and merely preserves itself from corruption. It is rather the life that endures death and maintains itself in death. Spirit achieves its truth only in as much as it finds itself in absolute abscission. It is not this power as something positive that averts its glance from everything negative, as when we say of something that it is nothing or false, and that now we are done with it and can leave it behind and go on to something else. Rather, it is this power only insofar as it looks the negative in the eye and lingers with it. Thus, German idealism, too, dares to think evil as proper to the essence of being. The greatest attempt in this direction we possess in Schelling's treatise on the essence of human freedom. Nietzsche had a much too original and mature relation to the history of German metaphysics to have overlooked the might of thoughtful will in German idealism. The significance of German philosophy, Hegel, to elaborate a pantheism in which evil, error, and suffering are not felt to be arguments against divinity. This grandiose initiative has been misused by the existing powers, the state, etc., as though it sanctioned the rationality of those who happen to be ruling. In contrast, Schopenhauer appears as the stubborn moral man who, in order to retain his moral estimation, finally becomes a world denier, ultimately a mystic. This passage also reveals clearly that Nietzsche was by no means willing to join in the belittling, denigrating, and berating of German idealism which became common with Schopenhauer and others in the middle of the 19th century. Schopenhauer's philosophy, which had been available in its finished form since 1818, began to reach a broader public by mid-century. Richard Wagner and the young Nietzsche were also caught up in the movement. 
we obtain a vivid picture of the enthusiasm for power which moved young people at that time from the letters of the youthful Baron Karl von Gerstorf to Nietzsche. They were friends since their high school days at Schlupforta. Especially important are the letters Gerstorf writes to Nietzsche while at the front in 1870-71. to 71. Schopenhauer interpreted the state of affairs that he was suddenly now being read by the educated classes as a philosophical victory over German idealism. But Schopenhauer advanced to the forefront of philosophy at that time not because his philosophy conquered German idealism philosophically, but because the Germans lay prostrate before German idealism and were no longer equal to its heights. Its decline made Schopenhauer a great man. The consequence was that the philosophy of German idealism, seen from the point of view of Schopenhauer's commonplaces, became something foreign, an oddity. It fell into oblivion. Only by detours and byways do we find our way back into that era of the German spirit. We are far removed from a truly historical relation to our history. Nietzsche sensed that here a grandiose initiative of metaphysical thought was at work, yet for him it remained, had to remain, a mere glimmer. For the one decade of creative labor on his major work did not grant him the time and tranquility to linger in the vast halls of Hegel's and Schelling's works. Will is in itself simultaneously creative and destructive. Being master out beyond oneself is always also annihilation. All the designated moments of will, the out beyond itself enhancement, the character of command, creation, self-assertion, speak clearly enough for us to know that will in itself is already will to power. Power says nothing else than the actuality of will. Prior to our general description of Nietzsche's concept of will, we made brief reference to the metaphysical tradition in order to suggest that the conception of being as will is not in itself peculiar. But the same is true also of the designation of being as power. No matter how decisively the interpretation of being as will to power remains Nietzsche's own, and no matter how little Nietzsche explicitly knew in what historical context the very concept of power as a determination of being stood. It is certain that with this interpretation of the being of beings, Nietzsche advances into the innermost yet broadest circle of Western thought. Ignoring for a moment the fact that for Nietzsche, power means the same as will, we note that the essence of power is just as intricate as the essence of will. We could clarify the state of affairs by proceeding as we did when we listed the particular definitions of will that Nietzsche gives, but we'll now emphasize only two moments within the essence of power. Nietzsche often identifies power with force.
without defining the latter more closely. Force, the capacity to be gathered in itself and prepared to work effects, to be in a position to do something. is what the Greeks, above all Aristotle, denoted as dunamis. But power is every bit as much a being empowered in the sense of the process of dominance. But power is every bit as much a being empowered in the sense of the process of dominance, the being at work of force in Greek, energeia. Power is will as willing out beyond itself, precisely in that way to come to itself, to find and assert itself in the circumscribed simplicity of its essence in Greek, entelecheia. For Nietzsche power means all this at once, dunamis energeia entelecheia. In the collection of treatises by Aristotle, which we know under the title Metaphysics, there is one, Book Theta, that deals with dunamis energeia and entelecheia as the highest determinations of being. But Aristotle, still on the pathway of an original philosophy, but also already at its end, here thinks, i.e. asks about being, later is transformed into the doctrine of potentia and actus in scholastic philosophy. Since the beginning of modern times, philosophy entrenches itself in the effort to grasp being by means of thinking. In that way, the determinations of being, potentia and actus, slip into the vicinity of the basic forms of thought or judgment. Possibility, actuality, and necessity, along with them, become modalities of being and of thinking. Since then, the doctrine of modalities becomes a component part of every doctrine of categories. What contemporary academic philosophy makes of all this is a matter of scholarship and an exercise in intellectual acuity. What we find in Aristotle as knowledge of dunamis energeia and telecheia is still philosophy. That is to say, the book of Aristotle's metaphysics which we have referred to as the most worthy of question of all the books in the entire Aristotelian corpus. Although Nietzsche does not appreciate the concealed and vital connection between his concept of power as a concept of being, and Aristotle's doctrine, and although that connection remains apparently quite loose and undetermined, we may say that the Aristotelian doctrine has more to do with Nietzsche's doctrine of will to power than with any doctrine of categories and modalities in academic philosophy. But the Aristotelian doctrine itself devolves from a tradition that determines its direction. It is a first denouement of the first beginnings of Western philosophy in Anaximander, Heraclitus, and Parmenides. However, we should not understand the reference to the inner relation of Nietzsche's will to power to dunamis energeia and entelecheia in Aristotle as asserting that Nietzsche's doctrine of being can be interpreted immediately with the help of the Aristotelian teaching. Both must be conjoined in a more original context of questions. That is especially true of Aristotle's doctrine. It is no exaggeration to say that we today simply no longer understand or appreciate anything about Aristotle's teaching. 
The reason is simple. We interpret his doctrine right from the start with the help of corresponding doctrines from the Middle Ages and modern times, which on their part are only a transformation of and a decline from Aristotelian doctrine, which therefore are hardly suited to provide a basis for our understanding. Thus, when we examine various aspects of the essential of will to power as powerfulness of will, we recognize how that interpretation of being stands within the basic movement of Western thought. We discern how solely for that reason it is able to bring an essential thrust to the task of thinking in the 20th century. But of course we will never comprehend the innermost historicity of Nietzschean thought by virtue of which it spans the breadth of centuries if we only hunt for reminiscences, borrowings, and divergences in an extrinsic manner. We must grasp what it was that Nietzsche properly wanted to think. It would be no great trick, better it would be precisely that, a mere trick, if armed with a ready-made conceptual apparatus, we proceeded to flush out particular disagreements, contradictions, oversights, and over-hasty and often superficial and contingent remarks in Nietzsche's presentations. As opposed to that, we are searching for the realm of his genuine questioning. In the final year of his creative life, Nietzsche was wont to designate his manner of thinking as philosophizing with the hammer. The expression has more than one meaning in accordance with Nietzsche's own viewpoint. Least of all does it mean to go in swinging, wrecking everything. It means to hammer out a content and an essence, to sculpt a figure out of stone. Above all, it means to tap all things with the hammer, to hear whether or not they yield that familiar hollow sound, to ask whether there is still solidity and weight in things, or whether every possible center of gravity has vanished from them. This is what Nietzsche's thought wants to achieve. It wants to give things weight and importance again. Even if in the execution remained much remained unaccomplished and only projected, we should not conclude from the manner of Nietzsche's speech that the rigor and truth of the concept the relentless effort to ground things by inquiring into them was of secondary importance for his philosophical exertions. Whatever is a need in Nietzsche, and therefore a right, does not apply to anyone else, for Nietzsche is who he is, and he is unique. Yet such singularity takes on definition and first becomes fruitful when, we, when seen within the basic movement of Western thought.
What is the ethics? Metaphysics Book 9. We have treated of that which is primarily and to which all other categories of being are referred, i.e. of substance. For it is in virtue of the concept of substance that the others also are said to be quantity and quality and the like. For all will be found to involve the concept of substance as we said in the first part of our work and since being is in one way divided into individual thing quality and quantity and is in another way distinguished in respect of potency and complete reality and of function let us now add a discussion of potency and complete reality And first let us explain potency in the strictest sense, which is, however, not the most useful for our present purpose. For potency and actuality extend beyond the cases that involve a reference to motion. But when we have spoken of this first kind, we shall, in our discussions of actuality, explain the other kinds of potency as well. We have pointed out elsewhere that potency and the word can have several senses. Of these we may neglect all the potencies that are so called by an equivocation. For some are called so by analogy, as in geometry we say one thing is or is not a power of another, by virtue of the presence or absence of some relation between them. But all the potencies that conform to the same type are originative sources of some kind and are called potencies in reference to one primary kind of potency, which is an originative source of change in another thing, or in the thing itself, qua, an, qua other. For one kind is a potency of being acted on, i.e. the originative source, in the very thing acted on, on its being passively changed by another thing or by itself qua another. And another kind is a state of insusceptibility to change for the worse and to destruction by another thing, or by the thing itself qua other, by virtue of an originative source of change. In all these definitions is implied the formula, if potency in the primary sense. And again, these so-called potencies are potencies either of merely acting or being acted on, or of acting or being acted on well, so that even in the formulae of the latter, the formulae of the prior kinds of potency are somehow implied. Obviously then, in a sense, the potency of acting and of being acted on is one, for a thing may be capable either because it can itself be acted on or because something else can be acted on by it but in a sense the potencies are different for the one is in the thing acted on it is because it contains a certain originative source and because even the matter is an originative source that the thing acted on is acted on and one thing by one another by another for that which is oily can be burnt and that which yields in a particular way can be crushed. And similarly, in all other cases, 
But the other potency is in the agent. For example, heat and the art of building are present. One in that which can produce heat and the other in the man who can build. And so insofar as a thing is an organic unity, it cannot be acted on by itself, for it is one and not two different things. And impotence and impotent stand for the privation which is contrary to the potency of this sort, so that every potency belongs to the same subject and refers to the same process as a corresponding impotence. Privation has several senses, for it means one, that which has not a certain quality, and two, that which might naturally have it but has not it, either A in general or B when it might naturally have it, and either A in some particular way, for example, when it has not it completely, or B when it has it not at all. And in certain cases, if things which naturally have a quality lose it by violence, we say they have suffered privation. Timeless Rapture. Two Wisdom Dakinis, Neguma and Sukasidi received instruction directly from Buddha Wajra bearer.
I pray that all who read this book may be blessed. Milarepa resonated well with a generation of disillusioned by the artifice of social and political expediency and thirsting for truth and authenticity. Echoing the ecological imperative. Barf. Poetry inspires. During the liturgy, honoring the masters of the Shangpa lineage with offering and praise, participants recite this text aloud along with a separate collection of biographical poems. The Shangpa Kagyu lineage remained for seven generations, a one-to-one -one transmission, each master transmitting these instructions to a single disciple. The process of awakening does not imply abdication of individuality.
Awakening implies the discovery of freedom. Full enlightenment then can be understood to imply a total creative freedom. As the profound intelligence of wisdom and the selfless altruism of compassion, both natural to this awakened mind, respond spontaneously and appropriately in any situation. Appropriately, eh? This freedom is undistracted and uninhibited. Detachment from distraction leads to the ease of relaxed natural awareness. Perfectly focused in a state of utter ease and non-distraction. Accomplished masters can be experienced by others as having a presence imbued with a vividness or intensity that is the natural expression of undissipated being. Moreover, free of self-preoccupation and hence purely altruistic, their being is totally free of inhibition authentically grounded in and fearlessly expressing the integrity of the true nature of being. In creation phase meditations, we transform identity and perspective through deity yoga. In the completion phase meditations, we further refine these through such techniques as fierce inner heat, illusory body, lucid dream, and clear light. In the first case, we harness the rich power of creative imagination and the panoramic display of the deity configurations. In the second, we refine our focus and reveal an ever more subtle quality of experience as we meditate on the pathways, circulating energy, and vital essence drops. In the first, we transfer our need for structures of identity to the clear yet insubstantial forms of the deities. But in the second, we gradually transcend the need for any conventional support for identity at all. We encounter Kyungpo Naljor's five golden doctrines. These five are likened to the parts of a tree. The roots, Nyaguma's six doctrines. The trunk, the great seal amulet box. Branches, the three paths of integration. Flowers, white and red sky dancers and fruit immortal body and infallible mind
Hey, how's it going? That is the first I've heard that comparison.
Students are not to think of the teachings as a musk, a rare and profitable commodity, the teacher as a musk deer, and themselves as a hunter. The attitude we are advised to adopt is that of a patient who seeks the advice of a doctor. The primacy of the role of spiritual master in Tantra is not an invitation to a personality cult. Sing them in unison. The Shangpa style is homelessness.
It silently pervades the Himalayan region, yet is centered nowhere. Thus the whole universe, visible, audible, and conceptual, pointing out to myself and others the direct apprehension of the underlying reality, is nothing but the gesture of my Lama.
Those who sing these songs must relinquish thoughts of themselves as ordinary persons and remain steadfast within contemplative practice. The Citadel of the Mind's Nature To strike with the riding crop of encouragement
Mok Chokpa. In your abode, the charnel ground of compassion's display. Great bliss, spontaneously present and uncompounded, Great Buddha Wajra bearer, enlightenment's perfect rapture, sang this unborn innate melody I heard. Ordinary mind, how amazing. The preliminary practice is threefold natural repose. The main practice frees the four faults in their own ground. At the point of culmination, enlightenment's four bodies arise of themselves. The preliminary vow is the secret Vajra. Compassion and prayer enrich meditative experience. Whatever appears merges with the path. Manifest realization is non-meditation without distraction. Blend this in a state without thought to integrate it on the path. Clear light and gazes enrich the experience. After waking, merge clarity with absence of thought. Regard the luminosity of day, night, and the intermediate state as enlightenment self arising in separable three bodies. No one knows this, the Tantra's concealed ultimate meaning disclosed in a single instruction. Non-meditation and non-distraction. With familiarity and stability in this, you can now traverse awakenings, paths, and stages. Without mental activity, the two obscurations are purified in their own ground. The three bodies arise of themselves. The result is spontaneously present. All discourses and tantras teach this, but it is naturally concealed. You must learn it from the mouth of a blessed spiritual master. From thoughts clouds that billow within the space of ultimate enlightenment, the five poisons lightning flashes. See it as timeless great wisdom. Without mental activity, free from hope and fear, Ordinary mind, to you I bow. He placed this text like a heart in an amulet box he always wore at his neck. Nigyuma Nature of mind, wish-fulfilling jewel, to you I bow. Wishing to attain perfect enlightenment, visualize your body clearly as the deity to purify ordinary thoughts. Develop a noble intention to help others in pure devotion to your spiritual master. 
don't dwell on your spiritual master or the deity. Don't bring anything to mind, be it real or imagined. Rest uncontrived in the innate state. Your own mind, uncontrived, is the body of ultimate enlightenment. To remain undistracted within this is meditation's essential point. Realize the great, boundless, expansive state. Hey Stacy, how's it going? Myriad thoughts of anger and desire propel you within the seas of existence. Take the sharp sword of the unborn state and cut through them to their lack of intrinsic nature. When you cut a tree's root, its branches won't grow. On a bright ocean, bubbles emerge then dissolve back into the water. Likewise, thoughts are nothing but the nature of reality. Don't regard them as faults. Relax. When you have no clinging to what appears, what arises, it frees itself within its own ground. Appearances, sound, and phenomena are your own mind. There are no phenomena apart from mind. Mind is free from birth, cessation, and formulation. Those who know mind's nature enjoy the five senses' pleasures, but do not stray from the nature of reality. On an island of gold, you search in vain for earth and stones. Right now I'm reading a song by Niguma, uh, but the book as a whole is a collection of songs by Shangpa masters, collected by Jamgong Kongtrul, called Timeless Rapture. In the equanimity of the great absolute expanse, there is no acceptance or rejection, no states of meditation or post-meditation. When you actualize that state, it is spontaneously present, fulfilling beings' hopes like a wish-fulfilling jewel. Persons of the highest, middle, and common levels of capability should learn this in stages suitable to their understanding. Before this, I was reading a chapter from Heidegger's lectures on Nietzsche. It was a chapter on will and power. I think I might swap out. I actually find Buddhist discourse rather dry. This is the book. What shall we argue about? How about, is rapture an aesthetic state? No, I'm not.
Sure, it'd be better to have more people, but... There aren't many people that appreciate these things. There are a lot. Not here. But our genuine intention is to conceive of art as a configuration of will to power, indeed as its distinctive form. This means that on the basis of Nietzsche's conception of art, and by means of that very conception, we want to grasp will to power itself in its essence, and thereby being as a whole with regard to its basic character. To do that, we must now try to grasp Nietzsche's conception of art in a unified way, which is to say to conjoin in thought things that at first blush seem to run wholly contrary ways. On the one hand, art is to be the counter-movement to nihilism, that is, the establishment of the new supreme values. It is to prepare and ground standards and laws for historical intellectual existence. On the other hand, art is, at the same time, to be properly grasped by way of physiology and with its means. No, I do not. Viewed extrinsically, it seems to designate Nietzsche's position toward art as senseless, nonsensical, and therefore nihilistic. For if art is just a matter of physiology, then the essence and reality of art dissolve into nervous states, into processes in the nerve cells. Where in such blind transactions are we to find something that could of itself determine meaning Posit values and erect standards. In the realm of natural processes conceived scientifically, where the only law that prevails is that of the sequence and commensurability or incommensurability of cause effect relations, every result is equally essential and inessential. In this area, there is no establishment of rank or positing of standards. Can you recommend an episode? Everything is the way it is and remains what it is, having its right simply in the fact that it is. Physiology knows no arena in which something could be set up for decision and choice. To deliver art over to physiology seems tantamount to reducing art to the functional level of the gastric juices. Then how could art also ground and determine the genuine and decisive valuation? Art as the counter movement to nihilism and art as the object of physiology. That's like trying to mix fire and water. If a unification is at all possible here, it can only occur in such a way that art, as an object of physiology, is declared the utter apotheosis of nihilism, and not at all the counter-movement to it. And yet in the innermost will of Nietzsche's thought, the situation is altogether different. True there is a perceptual discordance prevailing in what he achieves, an instability, an oscillation between these opposite poles, which, perceived from the outside, can only confuse. In what follows, we will confront the discordancy again and again. But above all, we must try to see what it is that is altogether different here. All the same, in so trying, we may not close our eyes to what Nietzsche's Aesthetics as Physiology says about art and how it says it. To be sure, a conclusive presentation of that aesthetics is seriously impaired by the fact that Nietzsche left behind only undetailed observations, references, plans, and claims, 
We do not even possess an intrinsic, carefully projected outline of his aesthetics. True, among the plans for the will to power, we find one of Nietzsche's own sketches with the title Toward the Physiology of Art, but it is only a list of 17 items, not arranged according to any visible guiding thought. We will present in full this collection of headings of investigations that remain to be carried out, because in terms of pure content, it offers an immediate overview of what such an aesthetics was to treat. Toward the Physiology of Art 1. Rapture as Presupposition Causes of Rapture Typical Symptoms of Rapture The Feeling of Force and Plenitude in Rapture Its Idealizing Effect I don't have sound linked up. I generally find irony rather uh, mundane. It can be done well, but the factual increase of force, it's factual beautification. The increase of force, for example, in the dance of the sexes. The pathological element in rapture. The physiological danger of art. For consideration, the extent to which our value beautiful is completely anthropocentric, based on biological presuppositions concerning growth and progress. The Apollonian, the Dionysian, basic types, in broader terms, compared with our specialized arts. Uh, basically, I think, I think the mammalian physiology, which is our basic evolved nervous system, I think has caretaking as its basic purpose. Now regarding what we create with our minds, I'm not sure that anything created by a mind need necessarily have a purpose. The basic faculty of mind, I do believe evolved for that caretaking purpose, but it's since obtained sufficient independence to be independent of that purpose. So, 
caretaking is more than propagation. It's the increase of value to life. I don't think there's a mystical purpose or that it's anything that complicated. It's basically what everyone does all the time. You're just caretaking something or someone. Five, the Apollonian and the Dionysian. Basic types in broader terms compared with our specialized arts. Six, question where architecture belongs. Seven, the part artistic ca capacities play in normal life, the tonic effect of their exercise, as opposed to the ugly. Where do you see an end? The question of epidemic and contagion. The thesis of this work is that will to power and the increase of power is an intrinsic goal that is shared by all beings. I don't think that the principle that's common to human life and other life is bound by conceptions of self. Just think of death. Death is a constant force, constantly occurring for living beings everywhere, all the time. Nine, the problem of health and hysteria. Genius equals neurosis. Yeah, that's essentially in line with what I was saying before, that our cognitive capacity now operates independently of mere survival of the fittest in population uh, viability. Ten, art as suggestion, as means of communication, as the realm of invention, of the induction psychomotrice. Eleven, the inartistic states, objectivity, the mania to mirror everything, neutrality, the impoverished will, loss of capital. Uh, I would do chat rooms. What, what chat rooms would you recommend?
How about we talk in Discord? Thirteen, the inartistic states, vitiation, impoverishment, depletion, will to nothingness, Christian, Buddhist, nihilist, the impoverished body. Okay, would you prefer to talk some other means, like Skype? Or how about the old-fashioned phone? <laughs> 14. The inartistic states. The moral idiosyncrasy. The fear that characterizes the weak, the mediocre. Before the senses, power, rapture. Instinct of those whom life has defeated. Uh, basically the answer would be no. <laughs> I think religious systems are valuable, but I don't think their claims are 100% accurate and they rely upon um, essentially metaphors or something else
14. The inartistic states. The moral idiosyncrasy. The fear that characterizes the weak, the mediocre, before the senses, power, rapture. Instinct of those whom life has defeated. Fifteen, how is tragic art possible? Sixteen, the romantic type, ambiguous. Its consequence is naturalism. Seventeen, problem of the actor, the dishonesty. The typical ability to metamorphose as a flaw in character, lack of shame, the Hanswurst, the satyr, the buffo, the Gil Blas, the actor who plays the artist. 18. Art as rapture, medically. Tonic oblivion, partial, complete and partial impotence. 's multiplicity of different points of inquiry lies before us here, but no blueprint or outline of a structure, not even a preliminary mapping out of the space in which all this is to be joined. Yet at bottom the same is the case with those fragments assembled between 794 and 853, except that these go beyond mere catchwords and headlines in providing greater detail. The same is also true of the pieces taken up into volume 14, which belong here thematically. We must therefore try all the harder to bring a higher determination and an essential coherence to the materials that lie before us. To that end, we will follow a twofold guideline. For one thing, we will try to keep in view the whole of the doctrine of will to power for another, we will recall the major doctrines of traditional aesthetics. But on our way, we do not merely want to become cognizant of Nietzsche's teachings on aesthetics 
Rather, we want to conceive how the apparently antithetical directions of his basic position with respect to art can be reconciled. Art as counter-movement to nihilism, and art as object of physiology. If a unity prevails here, eventuating from the essence of art itself as Nietzsche sees it, and if art is a configuration of will to power, then insight into the possibility of unity between the antithetical determinations should provide us with a higher concept of the essence of will to power. That is the goal of our presentation of the major teachings of Nietzsche's aesthetics. At the outset, we must refer to a general peculiarity of most of the larger fragments. Nietzsche begins his reflections from various points of inquiry within the field of aesthetics, but he manages at once to touch upon the general context. So it is that many fragments treat the same thing, the only difference being in the order of the material and the distribution of weight or importance. In what follows, we shall forego discussion of those sections that are easy to comprehend on the basis of ordinary experience. Nietzsche's inquiry into art is aesthetics. According to the definitions provided earlier, art in aesthetics is experienced and defined by falling back upon the state of feeling in man that correspondence pertains to the bringing forth and the enjoyment of the beautiful. Nietzsche himself uses the expression aesthetic state and speaks of aesthetic doing and observing. But this aesthetics is to be physiology. That suggests that states of feeling taken to be purely psychical are to be traced back to the bodily condition proper to them. Seen as a whole, it is precisely the unbroken and dis indissoluble unity of the corporeal psychical, the living, that is posited as the realm of the aesthetic state, the living nature of man. When Nietzsche says physiology, he does not he does mean to emphasize the bodily state, but the latter is in itself always already psychical and therefore also a matter for psychology. The bodily state of an animal and even of man is essentially different from the property of a natural body, for example, a stone. Everybody is also a natural body, but the reverse does not hold. On the other hand, when Nietzsche says psychology, 
he always means what also pertains to bodily states, the physiological. Instead of aesthetic, Nietzsche often speaks more correctly of artistic or inartistic states. Although he sees art from the point of view of the artist and demands that it be seen that way, <clears throat> Nietzsche does not mean the expression artistic only with reference to the artist. Rather, artistic and inartistic states are those that support or advance or hamper and preclude a relation to art of a creative or receptive sort. The basic question of an aesthetics as physiology of art, and that means of the artist, must above all aim to reveal those special states in the essence of the corporeal psychical, i.e. living nature of man, in which artistic doing and observing occur, as it were, in conformity with and confinement to nature. In defining the basic aesthetic state, we shall at first not refer to the text of the will to power, but restrict ourselves to what Nietzsche says in the last writing he himself published, Twilight of the Idols. Toward the psychology of the artist. If there is to be art, if there is to be any aesthetic doing and observing, one physiological precondition is indispensable, rapture. Rapture must first have augmented the excitability of the entire machine, else it does not come to art. All the variously conditioned forms of rapture have the requisite force. Above all, the rapture of sexual arousal, the oldest and most original form of rapture. In addition, the rapture that comes as a consequence of all great desires, all strong affects. The rapture of the feast, contest, feat of daring, victory, all extreme movement. The rapture of cruelty, rapture in destruction, rapture under certain meteorological influences, for example the rapture of springtime, or under the influence of narcotics. Finally, the rapture of will, of an overfull teeming will. We can summarize these remarks with the general statement that rapture is the basic aesthetic state, a rapture which for its part is variously conditioned, released, and increased. The passage cited was not simply chosen because Nietzsche published it, but because it achieves the greatest clarity and unity of all the Nietzschean definitions of the aesthetic state.
We can readily discern what remains unresolved throughout the final period of Nietzsche's creative life. Although in terms of the matter itself, it does not deviate essentially from what has gone before when we compare to this passage number 798. Here Nietzsche speaks of two states in which art itself emerges as a force of nature in man. According to the aphorism's title, the two states meant are the Apollonian and the Dionysian. Nietzsche developed the distinction and opposition in his first writing, The Birth of Tragedy from the Spirit of Music. Even here at the very beginning of his distinguishing between the Apollonian and the Dionysian, the physiological symptoms of dream and rapture were brought into respective relation. We still find this connection in the will to power. Here as earlier, rapture is but one of the two aesthetic states juxtaposed to the dream. But from the passage in Twilight of the Idols, we gather that rapture is the basic aesthetic state without qualification. Nonetheless, in terms of the genuine issue, the same conception prevails also in the will to power. The first sentence of the following aphorism reads, In Dionysian rapture there is sexuality and voluptuousness. In the Apollonian they are not lacking. According to the birth of tragedy, to the remarks in the will to power and elsewhere, the Dionysian alone is the rapturous and the Apollonian the dreamlike. Now, in the Twilight of the Idols, the Dionysian and the Apollonian are two kinds of rapture, rapture itself being the basic state. Nietzsche's ultimate doctrine must be grasped according to this apparently insignificant but really quite essential clarification. We must read a second passage from Twilight of the Idols in company with the first. What is the meaning of the conceptual opposition which I introduced into aesthetics of the Apollonian and the Dionysian, both conceived as kinds of rapture? After such clear testimony, it can no longer be a matter simply of unraveling Nietzsche's doctrine of art from the opposition of the Apollonian and the Dionysian, an opposition quite common ever since the time of its first publication, but not very commonly grasped an opposition which nevertheless still retains its significance. Before we pursue the opposition within the framework of our own presentation, let us ask what it is that according to Nietzsche's final explanation pervades that opposition. With this intention, let us proceed with a double question. First, what is the general essence of rapture? Second, in what sense is rapture indispensable if there is to be art? In what sense is rapture the basic aesthetic state?
To the question of the general essence of rapture, Nietzsche provides a succinct answer. What is essential in rapture is the feeling of enhancement of force and plenitude. The feeling of force and plenitude in rapture. Earlier he called rapture the physiological precondition of art. What is now essential about the precondition is feeling. According to what we clarified above, feeling means the way we find ourselves to be with ourselves, and therefore at the same time with things, with beings that we ourselves are not. Rapture is always rapturous feeling. Where is the physiological or what pertains to bodily states in this? Ultimately, we dare not split up the matter in such a way as though there were a bodily state housed in the basement with feelings dwelling upstairs. Feeling, as feeling oneself to be, is precisely the way we are corporeally. Bodily being does not mean that the soul is burdened by a hulk we call the body. In feeling oneself to be, the body is already attained contained in advance in that self in such a way that the body in its bodily states permeates the self. We do not have a body in the way we carry a knife in a sheath. Neither is the body a natural body that merely accompanies us and which we can establish expressly or not as being also at hand. We do not, feeling as feeling oneself to be, belongs to the essence of such being. Feeling achieves from the outset the inherent internalizing tendency of the body in our Dasein. But because feeling as feeling oneself to be, always just as essentially has a feeling for beings as a whole, every bodily state involves some way in which the things around us and the people with us lay a claim on us or do not do so. When our stomachs are out of sorts, they can cast a pall over all things. What would otherwise seem indifferent to us suddenly becomes irritating and disturbing. What we usually take in stride now impedes us. True, the will can appeal to ways and means for suppressing the bad mood, but it cannot directly awaken or create a counter mood, for moods are overcome and transformed only by moods. Here it is essential to observe that feeling is not something that runs its course in our inner lives. It is rather that basic mode of our Dasein by force of which and in accordance with which we are always already lifted beyond ourselves into being as a whole, which in this or that way matters to us or does not matter to us. Mood is never merely a way of being determined in our inner being for ourselves. It is above all a way of being attuned and letting ourselves be attuned in this or that way in mood. Mood is precisely the basic way in which we are outside ourselves. But that is the way we are essentially and constantly. In all of this, the bodily state swings into action. It lifts a man out beyond himself, or it allows him to be enmeshed in himself and to grow listless. We are not, first of all, alive only then getting an apparatus to sustain our living, which we call the body. But we are some body who is alive. Our being embodied is essentially other than merely being encumbered with an organism. Most of what we know from the natural sciences about the body and the way it embodies are specifications based on the established misinterpretation of the body as a mere natural body. Through such means, we do find out lots of things, 
but the essential and determinative aspects always elude our vision and grasp. We mistake the state of affairs even further when we subsequently search for the psychical, which pertains to the body that has already been misinterpreted as a natural body. Every feeling is an embodiment attuned in this or that way, a mood that embodies in this or that way. Rapture is a feeling, and it is all the more genuinely a feeling, the more essentially a unity of embodying attunement prevails. Of someone who is intoxicated, we can only say that he has something like rapture. But he is, he is not enraptured. The rapture of intoxication is not a state in which a man rises by himself beyond himself. What we are here calling rapture is merely, to use the colloquialism, being soused. Something that deprives us of every possible state of being. At the outset, Nietzsche emphasizes two things about rapture. First, the feeling of enhancement of force. Second, the feeling of plenitude. According to what we explained earlier, such enhancement of force must be understood as the capacity to extend beyond oneself, as a relation to beings in which beings themselves are experienced as being more fully in being, richer, more perspicuous, more essential. Enhancement does not mean that an increase, an increment of force, objectively comes about. Enhancement is to be understood in terms of mood, to be caught up in elation, to be borne along by our buoyancy as such. In the same way, the feeling of plenitude does not suggest an inexhaustible stockpile of inner events. It means above all an attunement which is so disposed that nothing is foreign to it, nothing too much for it, which is open to everything and ready to tackle anything. The greatest enthusiasm and the supreme risk hard by one another. With that, we come up against the third aspect of the feeling of rapture the reciprocal penetration of all enhancements of every ability to do and see, apprehend and address, communicate and achieve release. In this way, states are ultimately interlaced, which perhaps would have reason to remain foreign to one another. For example, the feeling of religious rapture and sexual arousal two profound feelings coordinated quite precisely to an all but astonishing degree. What Nietzsche means by the feeling of rapture as the basic aesthetic state may be gauged by the contrary phenomenon. The inartistic states of the sober, weary, exhausted, dry as dust, wretched, timorous, pallid creatures under whose regard life suffers. Rapture is a feeling. But from the contrast of the artistic and inartistic states, it becomes especially clear that by the word Rausch, Nietzsche does not mean a fugitive state that rushes over us and then goes up in smoke. Rapture may therefore hardly be taken as an affect. Not even if we give the term affect, the more precise definition gained earlier. Here, as in the earlier case, it remains difficult, if not impossible, to apply uncritically terms like affect, passion, and feeling as essential definitions. We can employ such concepts of psychology by which one divides the faculties of the psyche into classes only as secondary references, presupposing that we are inquiring from the beginning and throughout on the basis of the phenomena themselves in each instance. Then perhaps the artistic state of rapture, if it is more than a fugitive affect, may be grasped as a passion.
But then the question immediately arises, to what extent? In the will to power, there is a passage that can give us a pointer. Artists are not men of great passion, whatever they like to tell us, and themselves as well. Nietzsche adduces two reasons why artists cannot be men of great passion. First, simply because they are artists, i.e. creators. Artists must examine themselves. They lack shame before themselves. And above all, they lack shame before great passion. As artists, they have to exploit passion, hiding in ambush and pouncing on it transforming it in the artistic process. Artists are too curious merely to be magnificent in great passion. For what passion would have confronting it is not curiosity, but a sense of shame. Second, artists are also always the victims of the talent they possess, and that denies them the sheer extravagance of great passion. One does not get over a passion by portraying it. Rather, the passion is over when one portrays it. The artistic state is never great passion, but it still is passion. Thus it possesses a steady and extensive reach into beings as a whole, indeed in such a way that this reach can take itself up into its own grasp, keep it in view, and compel it to take form. From everything that has been said to clarify the general essence of rapture, it ought to have become apparent that we cannot succeed in our efforts to understand it by means of a pure physiology that Nietzsche's use of the term physiology of art rather has an essentially covert meaning. What Nietzsche designates with the word Rausch, which in his final publications he grasped in a unified way as the basic aesthetic state, is bifurcated early in his work into two different states. The natural forms of the artistic state are those of dream and enchantment, as we may say, adopting an earlier usage of Nietzsche's in order to avoid here the word Rausch, which he otherwise employs. For the state he calls rapture is one in which dream and ecstatic transport first attain their art-producing essence and become the artistic states to which Nietzsche gives the name Apollonian and Dionysian. See ya, thanks for stopping by. The Apollonian and the Dionysian are for Nietzsche two forces of nature and art. In their reciprocity, all further development of art consists. The convergence of the two and the unity of one configuration is the birth of the supreme work of art, Greek art, tragedy. But if Nietzsche both at the beginning and the end of his path of thought thinks the essence of art, which is to say the essence of the metaphysical activity of life, in the selfsame opposition of the Apollonian and the Dionysian, still we must learn to know and to see that his interpretation in the two cases differs. For at the time of the birth of tragedy, the opposition is still thought in the sense of Schopenhauerian metaphysics, although rather because it is part of a confrontation with such metaphysics. By way of contrast, at the time of the will to power, the opposition is thought on the basis of the fundamental position designated in the title. So long as we do not discern the transformation with adequate clarity, and so long as we do not grasp the essence of will to power, it would be good for us to put aside for a while this opposition, which all too often becomes a vac vacuous catchword. The formula of Apollonian and Dionysian opposites has long been the refuge of all confused and confusing talk and writing about art and about Nietzsche. For Nietzsche, the opposition remained a constant source of boundless obscurities and novel questions. Nietzsche may well lay claim to the first public presentation and development of the discovery of that opposition in Greek existence to which he gives the name Apollonian and Dionysian. 
We can surmise from various clues, however, that Jakob Burkhardt in his Basel Lectures on Greek Culture, part of which Nietzsche heard, was already on the trail of the opposition. Otherwise, Nietzsche himself would not have expressly referred to Burkhardt as he does in Twilight of the Idols, when he says, The most profound expert on the Greeks' culture living today. Of course, what Nietzsche could not have realized, even though since his youth he knew more clearly than his contemporaries who Hertelin was, was the fact that Hertelin had seen and conceived of the opposition in an even more profound and lofty manner. Hertelin's tremendous insight is contained in a letter to his friend Bullendorf. He wrote it on December 4th, 1801, shortly before his departure for France. My friend, you have attained much by way of precision and skillful articulation, and sacrificed nothing by way of warmth. On the contrary, the elasticity of your spirit, like that of a fine steel blade, has but proven mightier as a result of the schooling to which it has been subjected. Nothing is more difficult for us to learn than the free employment of our national gift, and I believe that clarity of presentation is originally as natural to us as the fire of heaven was to the Greeks. On that account, the Greeks are to be surpassed more in magnificent passion than in the commanding intellect and representational skill which are typical of Homer. It sounds paradoxical, but I assert it once again and submit it to your examination and possible employment. What is properly national will come to have less and less priority as one's, one's education progresses. For that reason, the Greeks are not really masters of holy pathos, since it is innate to them, while from Homer on, they excel in representational skill. For that extraordinary man was so profoundly sensitive that he could capture the Junonian sobriety of the Western world for his Apollonian realm and adapt himself faithfully to the foreign element. But what is one's own must be learned as thoroughly as what is foreign. For that reason the Greeks are indispensable to us, but precisely in what is our own, in what is our national gift, we will not be able to keep a pace with them since, as I said, the free employment of what is one's own is most difficult. Here, Hurdlin contrasts the holy pathos and the occidental Junonian sobriety of representational skill in the essence of the Greeks. The opposition is not to be understood as an indifferent historical finding. Rather, it becomes manifest to direct meditation on the destiny and determination of the German people. Here we must be satisfied with a mere reference, since Hertelin's way of knowing could receive adequate definition only by means of an interpretation of his work. It is enough if we gather from the reference that the variously named conflict of the Dionysian and the Apollonian, of holy passion and sober representation, is a hidden stylistic law of the historical determination of the German people, and that one day we must find ourselves ready and able to give it shape. The opposition is not a formula with the help of which we could be content to describe culture, by recognizing this antagonism, Hertelin and Nietzsche early on placed a question mark after the task of the German people to find their essence historically. Will we understand this cipher? One thing is certain, history will wreak vengeance on us if we do not. We are trying first of all to sketch the outline of Nietzsche's aesthetics as a physiology of art by limiting ourselves to the general phenomenon of rapture as the basic artistic state. In that regard, we were to answer a second question, in what sense is rapture indispensable if there is to be art? If art is to be at all possible, if it is to be realized? What and how is art? Is art in the creation by the artist or in the enjoyment of the work 
or in the actuality of the work itself, or in all three together. How then is the conglomeration of these different things something actual? How and where is art? Is there art as such at all? Or is the word merely a collective noun to which nothing actual corresponds? But by now, as we inquire into the matter more incisively, everything becomes obscure and ambiguous. And if we want to know how rapture is indispensable, if there is to be art, things become altogether opaque. Is rapture merely a condition of the commencement of art? If so, in what sense? Does rapture merely issue and liberate the aesthetic state? Or is rapture its constant source and support? And if the latter, how does such a state support art, of which we know neither how nor what it is? When we say it is a configuration of will to power, then, given the current state of the question, we are not really saying anything. For what we want to grasp in the first place is what that determination means. Besides, it is questionable whether the essence of art is thereby defined in terms of art, or whether it isn't rather defined as a mode of the being of beings. So there is only one way open to us by which we can penetrate in advance, and that is to ask further about the general essence of the aesthetic state, which we provisionally characterized as rapture. But how? Obviously in the direction of a survey of the realm of aesthetics. Rapture is a feeling, an embodying attunement, an embodied being that is contained in attunement, attunement woven into embodiment. But attunement lays open Dasein as an enhancing, conducts it into the plenitude of its capacities, which mutually arouse one another and foster enhancement. But while clarifying rapture as a state of feeling, we emphasized more than once that we may not take such a state as something at hand in the body and in the psyche. Rather, we must take it as a mode of the embodying attuned stance toward beings as a whole, beings which, for their part, determine the pitch of the attunement. Hence, if we want to characterize more broadly and fully the essential structure of the basic aesthetic mode, it behooves us to ask, what is determinative in and for this basic mode, such that it may be spoken of as aesthetic? Look at these beautiful books at the beginning. Bones Scientific Library. Staunton's Chess Player's Companion. Lectures on Painting. Sturm's Morning Communings with God. Hard to avoid looking up Sturm. Voila. Christoph Christian Sturm.
Ty Smith's Geology and Scripture. N. M. Moser's History of Magic. Blair's Chronological Tables. Dante. The metaphysics of Aristotle, if we accept Kant's critique on certain portions of the works of the scholastics, embody perhaps the only formal treatise on the science yet in the possession of mankind. They therefore must be considered as one of the most precious remnants of antiquity, but their intrinsic worth can only be appreciated by those who have read them through with care. And this the student will discover when, after climbing up the rugged mountainside of abstract speculation, he finds himself standing on one of its summits, beholding far and wide the veils of thought spread before him in expanded glory. In evidence of this, he may at the outset be reminded that the subjects treated are those which have exercised the highest faculties of the human reason, and that he will there find an able review of the Greek philosophy, a refutation most complete and elaborate of skepticism, a demonstration a priori and a posteriori of God's existence, an examination into the relation of metaphysics to the other sciences, an overthrow of the ideal hypothesis of Plato, as well as the theory of Pythagoras, an elucidation of the nature of the infinite, and an investigation into truth in relation to man's faculties for the attainment of it. All men by nature are actuated with the desire of knowledge. And an indication of this is the love of the senses. For even irrespective of their utility, are they loved for their own sakes. And preeminently above the rest, the sense of sight. 
for not only for practical purposes, but also when not intent on doing anything. We choose the power of vision in preference, so to say, to all the rest of the senses. And the cause of this is the following, that this one of the senses particularly enables us to apprehend whatever knowledge is in the inlet of and that it makes many distinctive qualities manifest.
The name of Sturm has become so naturalized amongst us that we scarcely remember that the honor of his birth appertains not to our country. And there are few of our native productions so extensively known, so generally applauded or perused with so much pleasure as that sweet exotic, the reflections. To transplant, therefore, at length, though late, another flower from the sacred parterre of this devout and elegant author into the soil of British literature and worship is a lot in which were my reputation and avocations as lofty and brilliant as they are lowly and obscure, I could not otherwise than boast and rejoice. Today is January 4th. The Christian's happiness and fate rest with the deity. What indeed is there that can disquiet my bosom if with a grateful and satisfied heart I enjoy the present and in regard to the future place my hope in God? He knows all my wants and possesses likewise the means of relieving them. His mercy will not deny me that which is really salutary for me. Why should I confide my welfare to men who are even as perishable as that welfare which I expect for them? Why should I pass my days in anxiety? My prosperity is in the hands of the Lord. He has already fixed the hour when it shall arrive. He has already determined its duration and how long I shall be glad in it. Trust in him, O my soul, and resign thyself to his wise and gracious governance, which orders all things for thy true benefit. But the future, oh, how sorrowful am I often when I look forward to it. How much trouble perhaps awaits me in the day when I shall be old and hoary. What if my friends who are now my comfort desert me? Or what if a long and painful sickness destroy my health? Perhaps poverty, contempt, and various other miseries are to embitter the peace of my remaining days. Cowardly heart, wherefore this solicitude? The events of the future rest with God. He that rules all destinies has appointed thy fate to thee too. And what destiny, except that which is the most profitable for thee, can be anticipated from him? Granting even that in the future such occurrences as are disagreeable to crowd into thy space of life, yet still will they be advantageous, since for wise purposes they will be allotted to thee by thy father. And what avail thy melancholy presentiments? Can they arrest the fortune which thou seest afar off? or alleviate its accompanying grievances? Leave the future to the Lord. The lot which he has for thee is the best and the happiest, and if still any care concerning the future affect thee, then think of death, the grave, and judgment. Labor only for the salvation of thy soul, which depends upon thyself, and choose the path that leadeth to the most desirable attainment. Yet even in this point also has thy father been provident for thee. He is destined to thee a blessed immortality, and through Jesus assured it to thee. Walk therefore as it becomes a being to whom so high a destiny is appointed. Live in the faith of the Son of God, and in the hope of a happy consummation. Then will the future have nothing in it alarming for thee. God and Father of my life, I thank thee for this consolation. The belief that my happiness, both in this and in the other world, lies in thy keeping, shall fully tranquilize my mind. To thee do I look for everything, for every portion of my existence, and for this day also. Wilt thou appoint to me so much as is actually needful for my felicity? 
I will accept everything thankfully from thy hands, even the cup of woe which thou mayst perhaps present to me, while I drink cheerfully and say, as my Jesus said, Thy will be done. With these sentiments will I proceed, full of comfort and trust in the way in which thou commandest me to go. Thou wilt likewise, throughout the rest of my life, continue to be my God and my Savior. I trust in thy omnipotent goodness. Thou wilt make all well.